行，有过这样的向往：去到一个陌生的国家，住进别人的家里，和房东一起共进早餐，去深入的体会当地最原汁原味的风土人情和生活方式。那现在呢，这个愿望啊就被 Airbnb 在全球范围内给实现了。到现在为止 ，Airbnb 已经拥有五百多万个房源，在一百九十多个国家的八十多万个城市里，已经累计完成了四亿次居住。这个硅谷奇迹的故事就是从这个房间开始。Summer of 2007, roommates living in San Francisco, and suddenly the rent on our apartment was raised 25%. And I said, "That's too expensive. I'm moving out of here."、Uh, but the other two wanted to stay, but they had just quit their jobs to become entrepreneurs, also known as unemployed. So they didn't have any money to pay the rent either. But they're both designers, and they saw that an international design conference was coming to San Francisco, and they noticed that all the hotels in San Francisco were sold out. So they had an idea: why not rent out that extra bedroom I had vacated to designers who might need a place to stay? So they put up a simple、uh, blog post, and they managed to find three designers very quickly who wanted to stay by doing very little from their end, right? Very little. They had the extra space; it was just being wasted, and the five of them. All went to the conference together. Had a really good time. Joe and Brian introduced the guests to their social networks, their friends,、um, and so you know it was really a positive、uh, experience. And it was really just meant to be that, and that was going to be the end of the story. Except that a couple months later, the three of us were thinking, we want to start a company, but what was it going to be? And we reflected on this this、uh, this story from a couple months before. And thought maybe there are other people in other situations、uh, where we could do the same thing. Why don't we try to make it just as easy to book someone's home? Airbnb 啊，在一开始的时候被所有的投资人都拒绝了。还有一个投资人说啊，他们是所有项目里面最不可能成功的一个。更糟糕的是呢，金融危机即将来临，投资人呐、啊，马上连见都不可能见他们了。但内和两个小伙伴就决定要再试试看。全天全职、全身心地投入到这个运营当中，那他们拼命的工作，努力和用户去沟通，关注细节，完善产品，最后啊，使到这个异想天开的主意大获成功。Even after you had, you know, a great idea, you had nothing to really copy from because it's something new that you're trying. So in the beginning, it really wasn't easy. How tough did it get, and what lessons did you learn from that? It was very tough that first year.、Um, everyone thought we were crazy.、Uh, when we approached investors, they would tell us three things. They would tell us,、um, you know, this is not something I myself would use. I don't want to sleep in someone's couch or or someone's extra bedroom. I don't want to do that. Two, they said, I can't imagine it's a big market. And then three, they said, you know, what about safety? No investor during the first year would give us even a second meeting. You know, in retrospect, it seems like such an obvious idea. You know, and and it it is relative. It is mainstream now. But back then. Uh, everyone thought we were crazy,、um, and yet, because of what we had seen、uh, a few months earlier with those three guests who stayed with us, and because that experience was so magical, we knew we were onto something, and so we stuck with it. Because a whole year has gone by, we have no jobs,、um, we still have to pay our rent, and we still have expenses, and so we're actually in debt. So、uh, we said, let's give it three more months, where we're going to be 100% focused, which means there's going to be nothing else in our lives. And during this period, we were a part of something known as Y Combinator. It's a, a very well-known accelerator program.、And、so it's a little bit like a boot camp, and it got us really focused. We basically woke up every day at 8 a.m. and worked until midnight. We maybe took a couple hours off to to shower and eat and go to the gym. Those those kinds of things. But otherwise, all we did was work six or seven days a week.、Um, and and we knew we had only three months. And, and the agreement was that if in three months We're not in a materially better place, then we will quit and we'll feel we'll feel okay about it, because nobody wanted to quit and disappoint the other two、mm-hmm. co-founders. But、agreement. like a good closure, if you、yeah. know you really try、exactly. so、your best. Exactly. And actually, everything changed over those three months.、Um, what happened was we got a very important piece of advice, which was to go meet your users. And at the time, we thought we're building internet company. And internet is special because it's so scalable, and you can't possibly meet all your customers on the internet.、Um, but in, when you're trying to get product market fit,、uh, it is actually really important to meet your customers. And so, we actually went to New York. We met every single customer we had in New York City. First, we realized that their photos of their homes、um, weren't very good, and so we offered to take the photos for them. 
uh, with a professional camera. Second, we would sit with them at their computer and kind of give them a tutorial on how to use the service. Third, we would invite them later on to come have drinks with us and we'd build a relationship. So they're much more cooperative. Yes. And so, you know, we could give them advice like maybe you should lower your price, uh, maybe we can like write a better description for your property, here are these really good photos. And it turned out once we had really attractive properties in New York City, a very expensive place, uh, with great prices, um, before you knew it, they were getting booked. Um, and folks from around the world uh, would, would find it, book it, have a great experience, and then those guests would go back to their homes in other countries and tell their friends. And very quickly, the guests were becoming hosts and their friends were becoming hosts, and the idea started to cross-pollinate. Prior to that, we had been making $200 a week. Within three months, we got to $4,500. Mm, and just based on that loyal customer Just by meeting every single customer in, in New York, they like to talk about their trip, right? And, um, and Airbnb plays a very distinct role in terms of how they experience the trip. Travel is about having experiences. It's about meeting people, uh, having new ways of thinking and reflection. And so everything we're going to offer, and we have you know, five and a half million homes, um, is going to be with that spirit. And so what's propelled the growth over 10 years is tremendous word of mouth and a cross-pollination. You know, up until this point, mass uh, tourism was very much about mass tourism, very commoditized. What we do is very different. We do that by, by allowing you to stay in a home. Um, and you know, the home itself um, you know, has benefits of more space, maybe better price point, uh, more amenities, uh, like a kitchen, for example. Um, but it also means you you're, might be in a residential neighborhood, you might stumble into the coffee shop on the corner. You know, all these little things um, are going to be different um, in a way that you probably couldn't have imagined. It's going to help form an experience that is different than, say, the next person who comes to New York or to San Francisco. Um, and I think in this day and age, you know, everybody is sharing their lives on WeChat and Instagram and these services, and, and they want to tell a unique story. And I think we really play into that trend. Yeah, but as you said, like safety is a big thing, right? Like even, either if it's living in a stranger's home or offering a home to a stranger. What kind of mechanisms have you put in to ensure that you know safety wouldn't be an issue? One, uh, very rich user profiles. Uh, so you know you get to see the picture of the person, their name, uh, their age, where they go to school, where they work. Ask them questions. Uh, verify information. Part two was we handle the money, right? So when you book with Airbnb, you pay Airbnb. Uh, and Airbnb holds your money until after you arrive. Only then does the host get paid. And what's powerful about that is that the host knows they need to deliver on the, the promise in order to get the reward. And then third is uh, after the stay. The guest reviews the host. The host also reviews the guest. And this is really powerful because both parties accumulate reputation over time. A few years in, we kind of had our first uh, situation where uh, an apartment was, was damaged significantly and it became a big publicity thing. And suddenly here's a proof point that you can't. Um, and so it was a real existential crisis at that time. This was something we had to change the way we operate. And what we did for three weeks is we took everybody in the company and we brought them together for two days and we brainstormed. What are all the possible ways we can make our service more trustworthy, more safe? And we came up with hundreds of ideas brainstormed by everybody in the company and then over the next three weeks we actually built 40 of them and so during this time we started our 24 7 customer service our dedicated trust and safety team our, our host guarantee same for personal safety there, there's a million dollar insurance policy included you know we realized that this is an opportunity to actually improve ourselves and it's um, it's been really important because today we've had more than 400 million guests use Airbnb uh, and and you know, negative experiences are very rare, but it's because of all the effort we've put in along the way and the innovations. 十年的时间，从一个没有投资者肯投资的项目，到颠覆酒店业，成为一种全球文化现象，带来了更个性化的生活方式。那 Airbnb 啊，虽然没有拥有任何一家酒店，却成为了全球最大的酒店连锁公司。那它的房源数量啊，已经多于全球前五大品牌酒店房源数量的总和。So looking back, I guess, like, what has been the hardest thing? I mean, the hardest thing was definitely that first year, right, where you're financially struggling. But you guys were very creative in uh, financing your business. We 
had launched the company officially in August of 2008 um, at the Democratic National Convention that was being held in Denver, where at the time Barack Obama received the nomination of his party to be the presidential candidate. This was a historic event, and it was going to be held in a stadium that holds 80,000 people. And we saw that Denver, the city, only has 17,000 hotel rooms. So this is this perfect opportunity to launch Airbnb. There'll be a need for extra uh, rooms, extra housing, and uh, there's going to be a lot of media attention. But even better is we got on the news in week one of launching. Once the convention was over, nobody cared about us anymore. We were, we were, we were no longer relevant. And so we were, and, and the recession had just begun too. Hard to come down from that. How do you? And somehow they came up with the idea of a presidentially themed breakfast cereal, came up with very creative artwork for these boxes, um, and had them produced and uh, stuffed them with cereal. And actually when we were on CNN, it became the number one political video of the day. Um, but we like to joke, half joke, that we funded the company in the first year by selling breakfast cereal because we made $30,000 in one week, which was more than we had made all year in our core business. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a very funny story. But just using whatever resources you have to try to come up with solutions, right? To, to solve your problems. Yeah. 下一节，我们继续聆听共享经济开创者对于共享之路下一站的分享，也走入内的生活，探索它何以获得成功。在二零零八年，内和两个小伙伴决定创业的时候，共享经济这个概念还没有出现。Airbnb 的快速成功点燃了这个概念，启发了无数帮助人们分享生活用品、交通工具和知识经验的公司。而内则说 ，Airbnb 共享之路的下一站，则是生活方式和人生体验。This is, um, these are posters.、Uh... Each featuring one of our experiences,、mm. which I mentioned earlier. Experiences are ordinary people taking something that they're passionate about and、uh, making that available to travelers from around the world. Small scale, like you know, two to ten people at a time. You know, so this guy is apparently offering basketball. <laughs> You're coming to San Francisco. You want to play basketball? They design the experience. They price it themselves. Look at the diversity of stuff you can do here. You know,、mm. like、uh, you've got street art tours in the neighborhood. Surfing, making cocktails.、Uh, there's something for everyone. But when you look ahead in this big wave of、uh, sharing economy, where are the the new opportunities, or what's sort of like the next big thing? We want to help travelers have、uh, more unique, authentic travel experiences. We want to make sure that they don't feel like outsiders when they're in a new city. We want to make them feel like insiders. Two years ago, we launched a new product called Experiences, and this is something similar, whereby、um, Amongst our host community, these ordinary people,、um, we say take something it is that you're passionate about, or you have specialized knowledge. You know, maybe you are a dressmaker or a painter, or maybe you love to、um, go kayaking, and you can turn that into an experience that you make available to travelers from around the world. So, in addition to offering things, you're offering skills and experiences. That, that's right. That's right. And then beyond that, though, we really see Airbnb as a Platform for the entire trip, kind of a one-stop shop for any aspect of travel that you need, but doing it in our own Airbnb way, which means giving you the most local, authentic, unique experience,、um, one vertical category at a time. So we have homes, we have experiences, and there'll be more coming soon. So I guess when you think about growth strategy, one is sort of like going deeper with your existing customer base, and the other way probably going wider. And we see that you enter China in 2014, and、uh, but China is a very different market. So how do you view competition in China? How is it that we can be successful in China? What's going to set us apart?、Um, and what we identified from the start is outbound travel. So Chinese travelers who want to go outside of China, none of the local companies can offer that. And actually. The, Our, our Chinese travelers—they they go abroad, they have great experience, and they come home and they think to themselves, you know, 
maybe I can become a host. Suddenly, these same travelers are saying, why not we use Airbnb domestically? They have lots of homes. Um, and so domestic is now the fastest growing part of our business. And did you launch the experience project in China too? Yes, yes. Uh, so we have, uh, it's still very new, uh, but we have 400 experiences uh, in China. Particularly Chinese travelers, you know, they're very interested in exper meeting, meeting foreigners, yes. uh, understanding how other people live in China. 80% of our users uh, are millennials. You know, we see technology accelerating at an unseen speed in history. How has that uh, impacted, you know, Airbnb? Technology will change, and, but I think there'll still be a hunger for people-to-people -people interaction, which is what we focus on as a business. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think, you know, it's become a little bit of a problem with all this technology that people are feeling more disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that being said, I think Airbnb can take a very different approach and, and, and help keep people uh, interacting face to face and, and having meaningful exchanges and, um, and, and forging those bonds. So what's your vision for Airbnb and how do you want the world to be different with Airbnb in it, you know, 10, 20 years from now? To make the world a smaller place, mm. to forge understanding uh, between, between people, between countries. Uh, you know, we sometimes call it people to people diplomacy. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's really important. Um, you know, governments will have differences uh, and, and things will arise, but it's important that, um, you know, people still be able to relate to one another. And if you have a friend uh, in every country, uh, I think suddenly the world becomes a much smaller place. And, you know, I think you know, that's what's fundamentally important at the end of the day, um, is understanding that we're more similar than different. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy to lose sight of that. 我们看到啊，就在这个高效高速运转、快速变革的世界里面呢、啊，其实很多东西都是可以被先进的科技所替代的。那人与人之间的关系呢，越来越远，人变得越来越孤独，世界呢，仿佛也好像变得越来越的冷冰冰。那 Airbnb 呢，就希望给予这个世界啊更多的温度。我们看到人本质上其实就是一种社会动物，那希望有朋友、有圈子，很多功能性的东西，很多是可以被替代的。就好像酒店的房间，换一个酒店也可以住，但是呢，人与人之间的这种关系和体验其实是不会被替代的。Airbnb 啊，就是抓住了这个永远不变的需求，提供的不是说简单的旅途中的一个服务，而是赋予了旅途更丰富的内涵。这个波士顿长大的年轻人喜欢编程，敢于尝试，可以说在他读高中的时候就第一次创业成功了。And you started coding very early. You well, started right. at 12, right? Yeah. So Just I, taught I, yourself. I started coding at 12. Uh, the story is that uh, my dad is an electrical engineer. He would always bring home things from work. So I was always tinkering, taking electronics apart. Uh, we also had a computer uh, in the home. And this is back in the 90s, so that was a little mm, less Very common. rare. Right. And so, um, well, one day I was homesick from school at the age of 12. And uh, I took a book off his bookshelf. And it was basically had instructions on how to create simple programs on the computer. So I was curious. I read this book. I started tinkering on the computer. And this became a hobby. Uh, um, and I, I started uh, asking my parents for computer books uh, for, for, for Christmas, for my birthday. And you were just interested. Yeah, I just did this on my own as a hobby. I was posting my work on the Internet at the time. I was posting on the Internet, and I said, if you like what I'm posting, uh, send me $5. <laughs> uh, nobody ever sent me five dollars. However, at the age of 14, I got a phone call, and somebody said, "I saw what you posted on the internet, and I want to pay you a thousand dollars to create something similar but a little bit different." And starting at the age of 14, for the next four and a half years, uh, I ran a business in high school. That uh, through that, I, I made uh, actually almost a million dollars in high school. But more important than that, more impactful than that, uh, was the lesson I learned. Uh, the lesson I learned was, one, I can teach myself all the skills. Because I had no training. I wasn't learning this in school. I was teaching myself, and I was actually building things that people value. They valued so much they were willing to pay me. And that was a very powerful lesson in terms of uh, you know, determination and confidence. And it was from that that I realized that you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. And you have so much free time during high school to do this on the side? Well, I wouldn't say it that way. Um, <laughs> I've never been one to waste any time, um, and so I was very busy in high school. I did not waste a minute. Um, I wasn't just actually doing my business either. Uh, I ended up graduating top of my class um, and also 
track and field. Uh, Where do you think you got all those from? Like, is it just values from your parents? My parents are, are very hard workers. My dad is a, a very much kind of like a do-it-yourself dad. You know, he never hires anybody to do anything. He's never watching TV or, or relaxing. He doesn't, his way of relaxing is to do a project. Mm. And so that was the environment I grew up in, which is you're always busy doing whatever it is you're kind of passionate about. But how has, uh, you know, sort of achieving success at such a young age has impacted your life or how you behave or how you are as a person? Uh, <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of time to think about it. There's, there's I mean, two big components to my life, right? It's, it's the work and the family. And, you know, work, there's just been so much to do. And I think there's so much we could be doing. That's why all three founders uh, are still 100% focused on the business, even after 10 years. Uh, you know, I get up every morning excited to, to come in here. And then on the family side, you know, I, when I started this, I, I, I was not married. I'm now married and I now have two kids. Regardless of the success, you know, the priorities are the same and, and they're, they're pretty straightforward. You know, it's continue to pursue the vision at work. Uh, and it's to, you know, uh, to make family uh, the number one priority, though. 在外人看起来啊，内拥有一个很完美的人生，典型的高富帅。那出生在波士顿一个中上层的家庭，他十几岁的时候啊，就学会了写代码。那靠写代码，中学就赚到了近百万美金，竟然还没有影响到他的学业，是以这个全校第一的成绩考进了哈佛，而且连学费都是自己交的。那后来当然因为创业成功啊，成为了这个全世界最年轻的亿万富翁之一。但我们看人都会发现，这个完美的出现是有根源的。那父母对小孩的影响太大了。那内的爸爸呢是电子工程师，使内啊从小耳濡目染，接触到技术，培养了对技术啊深厚的兴趣。那他爸爸呢是个工作很努力的人，也是闲不住的人，从来没有这种所谓无所事事的时候。所以内啊从小就养成了努力工作的习惯，从来没有闲下来的时间。因为他觉得有太多有意义、有意思的事情等着他要做，那他所有的时间都被排满，而时间长年累月积累下来就比别人多。我们在看到一个人最耀眼的一面的时候啊，不要忘记这个背后有多少的付出。在幸运之神眷顾之前，其实要积累了很多年，才可以在机会出现的时候好好的把握住。感谢收看《古北水镇领航者》。下一集，我坐上一行创始人胡华志自己研发的小型载人无人机，听他谈二十载的载人无人机梦。